Hey, hello friends. Good morning and good evening, everyone. If you are attending a Tequila webinar for the first time, welcome to Tequila. Or if you are a community member, then welcome back. I'm Sham Shashi and I will be your host today. We have a very special speaker today, uh, Bas from Netherlands. Bas will be sharing about mocking APIs for more efficient testing and automation. And about Bas, uh, Bas is a test automation consultant and trainer. He has been working with the people and teams on improving their test automation strategy. And this uh, webinar has been sponsored by Applitudes. So we will be having a Kahoot quiz at the end of the session. So we will be giving away three Chromecasts for the first three places, okay? So Bas, uh, over to you, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Siam, for that introduction. And thank you everybody for joining uh, from wherever you are really. So uh, I just had a very quick browse through the list of names and I'm happy to say that I recognize some of them. Um, there's at least one other person from the Netherlands who's joined, I, I just saw, uh, but I also saw a lot of people from probably all around the world. Most of you are, as, as, as Siam told me, probably in or around Singapore, or at least in Southeast Asia. So uh, yeah, welcome all of you. And, uh, and again, Siam, thank you so much for having me. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to um, talk to you about API mocking and how it can help you to do more efficient testing and automation. Uh, the first part of this session, and that's probably going to be somewhere around, somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, depending on, on, on um, how long winded I get on and, and what I come up, what stories I come up with. Um, it's going to be, uh, me talking about what is simulation, what are the benefits of uh, mocking stopping AB, uh, APIs, um, how can it help you do better testing and better automation. And after that, and because um, talking about this stuff is fun, but uh, what makes it even more lively and tangible for you is uh, by actually showing you how it works and what you can do with API mocks, so I've prepared a little demo, a live demo for you where I show you how use how you can use uh, simulated APIs to help you in your testing and automation efforts. I'm going to do that using um, a demo application that simulates an online bank. And as the API mocking tool, I'm going to, to use um, a Java-based tool called WireMock. Um, but actually the tool that I use is not, as, is not really that important um, because for me that the, the concepts and the reasons behind doing this are much more important than showing you everything about the tool. So I, I'm happy to take any and all questions about WireMock as a tool uh and about what it is that i'm testing here but please keep in mind that at least for me and the, the, the concepts behind api mocking and stuff are much more important than knowing everything about a specific uh, about a specific tool that i'm using and that it's it i picked that tool because i'm familiar with it because it's open source so everybody can use it um but it's really not all that important um so um, to start this presentation off, I was, um, as I said, like like so many of you, I'm, I'm, I've been working from home for more than a year now, um, and it saves a lot of time commuting, um, and I tend to spend a lot of that time that I that I saved on commuting just browsing stupid stuff on the internet, um, and I'm I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who's doing that. Um, and one of the things that I discovered is that there's a Guinness World Record for chainsaw juggling. Um, this is Ian Sullivan. No, it's not Ian Sullivan. He's um, he's called Ian. I forgot his last name. Um, he lives in Truro in, uh, in the province of Nova Scotia in Canada. 
And um, Ian is the world record holder in chainsaw juggling. Um, and he managed uh, 105 throws with three chainsaws. Um, what, by the way, what the what the Guinness World Record website did not say was what happened on throw number 106. If he just dropped the chainsaw, if it um, went flying through his house, which you um, supposedly see there in the background, or something else entirely happened and we're never going to hear from Ian again, I don't know. Uh, but what I is he managed to juggle chainsaws for running chainsaws and running chainsaws for at least 105 times um so and 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 you're probably wondering now what the bleep does this have to do with um what we're going to talk about today um there's a reason i chose this anecdote and this picture and that's because to me at managing test environments often um feel somewhat like juggling chainsaws. There's things running everywhere and you try to keep everything in the air uh, all at the same time. And um, if you don't watch out and if you're not really careful with what you're doing, uh, things are going to start to hurt pretty quickly. So um, there has, a, and, and maybe it's a little far-fetched, but there is a similarity for me with between change or juggling and managing test environments. Um, and, with, and because uh, applications uh, that we're building right now, and they are not the monoliths or the isolated applications that we had back in the day. Um, applications consist of a wide variety of components or systems, uh, services that are um, linked together to form uh, applications or systems of applications. Uh, and so a typical system um, that a development team or um, a company is working on is developing and selling uh, consists of dozens and in some cases even hundreds of different components. And all those components, technically, they can be developed and tested and deployed individually. And especially if we talk about microservices-based architectures, that's an, a, a, um, a, a, a prime example of these kinds of highly distributed, loosely coupled application architecture, application designs. Um, and all of these components, uh, they are often developed in different teams. And maybe different teams in the same department, maybe different teams in the same organization. But often enough, they are at different teams, different uh, in different teams, in different organizations, different countries, different continents, even sometimes. And because development of modern software systems is so distributed, and that means that uh, in order to be able to do proper integration and end-to-end -end testing, um, all of the components need to be in a specific predefined state every time you want to run your A, every time you're going to run your integration and end to end tests. Um, and the more components and dependencies you have in your test environment, the harder it's going to be to have all of those dependencies in place um, whenever you want to run your tests and, and people, eh, because development cycles are uh, so much shorter these days, uh, where it, what, it used to be months, then it was weeks, and now it's days, and in some cases even hours. And every time a new iteration or a new version of, the, of, a, of a component is developed, uh, it needs to be tested. It needs to be tested, uh, not just as a single entity, as a standalone entity, but also in integration with all of the other components that make up your entire application. Um, but in these distributed test environments, uh, getting all of the components in the right state at the right time on demand is pretty hard. Uh, because ever, and I've listed some reasons for this on this slide, and because uh, 
these all of these components are developed in parallel. So and maybe you want to test your component against another component, but the functionality that you want to test against is not yet available because the other teams is working really hard as well, but they didn't finish their development yet. Um, maybe you're working with a dependency, you have to work, deal with a dependency where it's really hard to configure the right test data in there. And because uh, a, your order number, your customer number needs to be present in that other component as well, but you don't have control over all the test data that's in that component. Uh, maybe there are these systems that, um, and especially, this is especially true for older and mainframe like uh, server systems, mainframe systems. Um, and those are expensive. They're really expensive to, to keep running, to maintain them. Uh, so it's highly likely that you have to share access to those dependencies, to those components with a lot of other teams. That means hey, you have, hey, you maybe have specific day and time slots that you can, um, and only during that, that time slot, you can run your integration tests um, against uh, a mainframe, for example. Uh, and that's all well and good, but if you want to deliver new iterations a couple of times a day, um, only being able to run your integration tests every Tuesday between three and five um, is going to be a pretty big blocker pretty soon. Uh, and the final example of how these dependencies, the, these components that you need to work with in your test environment can block you is if you're working with third-party software as a service platforms, um, some of them, they charge you by the request or by the tick or by the message that you send or by the time you log in, for example. Um, and it means that the more often you test and the more requests you send, the more times you log in, for example, the more accounts you make, um, the more expensive it's going to be. And this is especially the case if you do a lot of performance testing, uh, if you want to run small scale performance tests uh, a couple of times a day, um, having to pay by the request gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. And so that's another reason, and maybe for, yeah, well, I want to test more, but I can't because we just don't have the budget. And so um, a typical test environment nowadays looks a little bit like what you see in the picture here. And we have our system under test in the center, and that's the, the application or the component or the service that we're working on inside our development team. Uh, and that's connected to a lot of different uh, other services dependency systems uh, that our system on the test interacts with. Uh, it pulls data from uh, a different component. It sends reports to some component. Uh, in, in some way, it communicates with all these dependencies. Um, but uh, as, as we saw in the previous slide, there are a lot of different reasons why um, communicating with that dependency for testing purposes is hard. Uh, because it's under development, because there's no suitable test data, because you have limited access to it, and so on and so on. Um, and this is blocking you typically in the volume and the frequency with which you want to do your tests. Uh, because, uh, well, we can only test with uh, a couple of different account numbers or customers, or uh, um, our tests run for five minutes, but it takes us four hours to set up the right test data. or we want to test multiple times a day, but we can only use that dependency, that dependent system every Tuesday between, between three and five, for example. Um, and the sol uh, one of the solutions uh, to this, uh, and, and that solution has been around, that it's not something new, uh, but a, uh, one of the typical solutions that uh, teams try to adopt here to deal with these uh, restrictions uh, with regards to their dependencies is using simulations. And that's exactly uh, what I'm going to talk and uh, what I'm talking about today and what I'm going to show you in the live demo. Um, the trick here and, 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 and the goal here 
in the MBM goal of these simulations is to simulate the dependency behavior. And uh, what I mean by that is I don't really care uh, what the programming language that the dependency is built in is. I don't care on what hardware it runs. The only thing I care about is does that, does that simulation behave exactly as the real dependency would? And that's that in terms of if I send request A, is it going to, is it going to return response B? Uh, but also, um, is it only going to send response B if I'm authenticated correctly? Or is it uh, behaving uh, if performance testing is a thing? And it should be. Um, is this simulation um, performing similarly? Is the, the, the response is the response time similar to that of the actual dependency? So, and that's all part of the behavior. So, and that's what you should focus on when you build the simulations, not on programming languages or hardware or operating systems or whatever. Um, the, unless it actively influences the behavior of your dependency, uh, but then it's part of the behavior. So and that's what you need to focus on when you actually uh, build these simulations. And uh, uh, the goal is F of, of using these simulations is uh, to regain that control over the test environment. So uh, basically not having to juggle with all these running chainsaws anymore. Uh, um, I want a test environment that's available on demand. And if I build a simulation, that's typically available on demand because that simulation is just another component in my code base, typically. It doesn't matter if it's developed, if I, de if I develop it myself or if the people who are responsible for developing the dependency also create a simulation that you can use for your testing purposes. Um, those simulations, they are available on demand. You have and, and you have full control over the test data that you put in there. And that's especially useful when it comes to simulating these edge cases or these fault situations. Uh, we're going to um, talk about and see that in the, uh, in the live demo as well. With simulations, it's often much easier to simulate specific edge cases, for example, uh, compared to when you're working with the actual dependency. Um, simulations, eh, they can easily be cloned. So every, eh, each team and even each individual contributor in a team can have their own individual copy of a simulation. Eh, you don't need to share these resources anymore. And eh, unless you're a really poor negotiator, and you probably won't have to suffer from these third-party component usage feeds anymore because it's something that you developed yourself. So uh, um, and that, pro and that, that probably gets rid of um, the usage fees of these third-party um, SaaS solutions that you need in your integration testing. And if done well, um, and using uh, these simulations, uh, using simulations leads to a test environment and, and a test environment that hopefully looks a lot more like this. So we have your system under test that still communicates to uh, communicates with all these different dependencies. Um, but there are, uh, um, because they're all uh, virtualized, the simulated, uh, that's probably even a better word, simulated um, and the, these limitations on the access that you have to these dependencies, they are removed. Uh, you have unrestricted access to all of the dependencies that you need to work with in your integration and end-to-end -end testing. That's the, uh, uh, the ultimate goal of uh, using the simulations. Really. Um, so I t uh, add a, a little bit about the terminology. Um, I typically talk about simulations uh, when I talk about uh, this stuff. And there are a lot of different terms going around in the software testing and software development world when it comes in the world when it comes to uh, when it comes to this. Uh, for example, uh, people talk about mocks. Uh, 
uh, that's even in the title of this webinar. Um, people talk about stubs. People talk about test doubles. People sometimes talk about dummies, about fakes, about spies. Um, people talk about service fertilization. Um, all of these terms, right? there's all of this terminology. Um, yes, there are differences. And if you want to have a good overview of what these, a, a good, well, uh, a well-defined difference between those individual terms, um, I'm not going to give you one. I just want to point you out to this this article from Martin Fowler. Hey, he wrote a uh, he wrote extensively about uh, what he sees are the differences between marks and stops and dummies and fakes and so on. Um, in the end, it is all about simulation. So that's why I typically talk about simulation uh, because I prefer not to get lost in these, um, these Wikipedia wars about definition of these different. And the same goes for, um, is it test automation or automation or automation in testing or checks or tests or whatever. Um, as long as we're all talking about the same thing, I don't really care what we call this. So and what I typically about, I talk about is simulation because that encompasses all of these different terminologies. And in the end, eh, all they do, all uh, the, the end goal of, of all, of, all of these different things is simulating the behavior of some component that you, um, A, I don't want to influence your test eh, when, when you, actively want to isolate your system under test from the, influ the, the, the influence that the behavior of your external dependencies has. So uh, then, you, uh, that, then you use simulations that you can control uh, because simulations you can control and you can uh, define the behavior of those simulations from within your test even sometimes. And uh, that's what mocking libraries for unit testing do, for example. Or uh, you want to do integration and end-to-end -end testing, but um, the component that you need or the dependency that you, that you literally depend on um, is not readily accessible. So you create a simulation, eh? some other component that behaves close enough to um, what the real thing does so you can do your actual testing. So again, um, I'm not going to give you, uh, this is a mock, this is a stub, these are the difference, whatever. If you want a definition, read that Martin Fowler article. I typically talk about simulations because that's what, to me, what the important part is. Eh? We are going to simulate behavior. That's what we're going to. And that's, that's the purpose because that's the end goal that I have. That I want to make my testing more, and I want to make my testing easier by simulating behavior of components that are outside my circle of control, uh, so to say. Um, and what I typically say about this as about simulation, what it helps me do is, um, first of all, test easier, uh, uh, earlier, sorry. It helps me test earlier because uh, I don't have to wait anymore until uh, development of a specific feature in a dependency finishes. I don't have to uh, wait until that other development team, and we all know that other development team is always a little bit slower than we are with uh, delivering the work so we can do proper integration testing. Um, but I want to test earlier eh, because uh, my team is much faster and I want to start testing and finding some of those uh, defects that we actually accidentally introduced. Uh, and I don't want to have to wait until that other development team is done uh, developing their and, and, and finishing wrapping up their work. So using simulations helped me to uh, to find some of my uh, some of the defects that I accidentally introduced a little earlier. Um, it also helps me to test more. Uh, because uh, and, and compared to working with live with actual dependencies, 
work in simulations, it is much easier to simulate these hard to these hard to find edge cases or these are these hard to simulate edge cases or these impossible to simulate fault situations uh, if we're working with actual dependencies and so the example i always give here is say i'm developing a web shop and i have an integration with a third-party payment provider like paypal or and we have ideal here in the netherlands for example um, or stripe or whatever um, and say I want to test if my web shop, if the order processing part of my web shop handles outages of that payment provider um, in the expected manner. Um, and because I have a web shop, uh, it's all live, I'm doing continuous deployment, I, well, I want to update 20 times a day. Uh, but at all times, I want to make sure that my web shop handles handles outages for at the payment provider um, in a proper way. Now I could just call the payment provider twenty times a day with the question: Could you please turn off your test environment for five minutes so I can run some tests? Um, that's not going to work. Um, and what you want is a simulation that uh, helps uh, that that you can just tell to when, when I send this order with these specific properties, just act as if you are down, act as if you are unavailable, and then let's see what happens um, when the order is processed, for example. And so these fault situations and these edge cases, they are typically much easier to simulate in um, with simulations. And, and um, finally, it also allows me to, to test more often uh, because I don't have to share these testing resources anymore. So instead of Tuesdays between three and five, I can now test around the clock because I have a simulation that behaves exactly or at least close enough to what the actual dependency does, but it's available all of the time instead of for just two hours a week. And so uh, uh, working with simulations, uh, um, helps you test earlier more and more often, really. Um, so be, uh, before I go to the uh, to the live demo part, um, does this really work? Does this really help? Um, uh, one of the best stories of uh, how this really helped is from a project I worked on, I think some five, six years ago. Uh, I worked with a large, telecommunications provider here in the Netherlands and they um, uh, and they sold uh, fiber optic uh, so and they sold um, uh, internet subscriptions and, and cable uh, to, over glass fiber or um, and uh, we were responsible for developing the order management uh, platform. And every time we want to test if an order could be uh, provisioned correctly, if it could be upgraded or downgraded or canceled or extended or whatever. Um, and especially with the creation of new, and the biggest problem was the creation of new subscriptions. Because for each subscription, we required a unique combination of zip code and house number. Uh, and the actual, because that was checked in some backend system, and first of all, it had to be a real, a real existing combination of uh, uh, zip code and house number. Uh, we couldn't use the same combination twice. And in order for our order, uh, in, in order for the, uh, the, the, the subscription for the order to be processed correctly, uh, that uh, zip code and house number uh, had to be marked as available in that backend system. Uh, but that could only be done once every two weeks by one person because they were the only one who was managing the test environment for that backend system. So every time uh, we uh, a test cycle was coming up, we had to hand them uh, a list of the zip codes and house numbers that we wanted that we wanted to use. And uh, it took them two weeks to uh, make those available. 
then we could start our testing. And of course, what happens when you test, you find defects. So you want to test again, you want to do a retest. Um, but because all of those, um, how, those, those zip codes and house number combinations were used, we had to provision new ones. We had to activate new ones. That took another two weeks. And so and you can imagine that a, a full uh, delivering a, a new release, a new version of the product that we built uh, took an awfully long time simply because the test cycles were way too long. Um, and so what we did instead was um, create a simulation for that backend system that just acted as if all zip code and house number combinations were available. Um, and no matter if they were activated or not, because we just said well, they are always activated. And they, uh, there was no check anymore if it was a real existing zip code and house number combination. So uh, even for the shortest streets in the Netherlands, we could add 100,000 different houses. And just because, yeah, it, that didn't really matter for the thing that we wanted to test. So, and, and using that simulation enabled us to for, uh, test, maybe not test earlier, but test way more and way more often uh, simply because uh, provisioning of a single connection didn't take two weeks anymore. It took two minutes, literally, because it was a, a sequence of uh, requests and responses. So it was uh, it were some, some SOAP-based web services, I believe. Um, but having a simulation that enabled us to provision uh, much, much, many, many more uh, connections in the same time and just do much more testing and even start to think about automating some of those tests because that's really hard if every new connection that you create uh, takes two weeks to provision. And then, then in that case, automation isn't, isn't really going to, isn't even really going to work. So and that, that's, and that's so that literally it brought the, Entire site at the time we needed for a full test cycle, it reduced that time from four weeks to uh, a day or two, really. And so that was, as you can imagine, that was a massive step in and just simulating that that one backend system was a massive step uh, in speeding up the entire development process for. Um, uh, for the organization that I was working in at the time. Um, so that that's um, the theoretical part, so to say. Um, Sim, are there any questions right now before we move to the to the live demo part? Um, yes, but I think only one question. So. That's not related to the talk, actually. So the question is, possible to share the difference between Postman and Wiremock? Um, yes and no. <laughs> they are two entirely different tools. So, um, um, could, could you, um, that, is that in the Q&A section? Could um, you keep that? Could you keep that open for a little bit until after the demo? Um, sure, sure. I'll try and address it when I explain stuff. But if it's not yet answered, I'd like to come back to that after the live event because I think that clears up uh, at least part of the uh, part of this uh, part of this question because they are they essentially they are two entirely different types of tools. Okay, we will bump it up again at the end of the session. Sure. Uh, we have one more question. So, should be a uh, knowledge in programming on the level as developers how in order to create simulations? Um, not necessarily. Um, it depends on the tool that you're using. Um, again, I'm going to. I'm not going to dive too deeply into Wiremark, but actually, Wiremark is pretty pretty straightforward to use. 
um, I can show you some of the features. Um, I'll link to a, an open source workshop that I have on Wiremox specifically, which is totally free for, for everybody so that they can get a little bit more familiar with uh, Wiremox as a tool. Um, but no, it is definitely not, um, it's not required to have uh, had to be uh, incredibly proficient in software development to use it. Of course, it helps, uh, but there are a lot of tools that you can have both open source and commercial tools that are out there on the market that can um, take away a lot of the difficult stuff for, and that can do a lot of the difficult stuff for you. And so Wiremock is one and one op an open source uh, library really, where you can either define the simulations in Java code. So that does require some, some development knowledge. Um, but there's also a different way of creating those simulations. And that's actually what I used in, uh, in this demo. And in, uh, to do that, you don't really need any programming experience at all. So, and, and these commercial, and these big commercial service virtualization tools, these mocking tools, uh, they typically provide a graphical user interface uh, that you can use to create your simulations without having to do, uh, uh, depending on the level of complexity, and without having to do any programming or just with a little bit of programming. And in the end, it's all about what what kind of tool is the best fit for uh, your skill set and your situation. Sometimes uh, it's easier to do things in code, and sometimes it is easier to uh, take a tool that uh, to, to use a tool that. Uh, does a lot of the coding for you, so to say. So a low-code tool like, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know any examples off the top of my head right now. But um, so, and, and, and also in this, this mocking service uh, fertilization world, there are a lot of tools out there right now. Some of them uh, require you to code, but a lot of them you can use uh, without a lot of development knowledge. There's something out there for everybody, really. Um, yeah, but I think after demo, things will be getting more clarified. So maybe we can do the Q&A session at the end of the session. What do you think? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I've got plenty of time. So, and I see I've been talking for a little longer than I was expecting to. So let's move on to the fun stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a demo uh, on that uses a simulation in combination with our own application on the test, so our own system on the test. And our system on the test is um, an online banking simulation, the world's least safe online bank, I like to, as I'd like to call it. Um, again, it's, it's a, a demo application from... Uh, a tool vendor actually. So, um, but the fact that it's from a tool vendor is totally irrelevant for this because I'm not even using their tools other than their demo application. Um, and it's an online banking simulation. And one of the things you can do there is um, request a loan. Yeah? So to temporarily increase your balance, I want to, requ I want to request a loan. That loan request, um, is sent to a third-party loan processor. So uh, this is what my uh, the uh, a very basic drawing of the architecture of our application. Uh, it has a, a front end which you can access through a browser um, that communicates to a business logic layer through APIs. And there's a back end there with the database. And I don't know how they communicate. Totally irrelevant for what we're doing right now. But there's also this loan processor service. And that's a third party service. So that's developed somewhere else in a different team. So if we want to test our request loan functionality, we depend on that loan processor API, that loan processor service, that loan processor component. Uh, but that's developed outside of our team. That's developed somewhere entirely, uh, somewhere entirely different. 
So uh, again, I had to overcome some of the troubles that we uh, uh, that we talked about that we saw earlier about and uh, maybe that loan processor is not always available. It's it's probably very hard to simulate outages or fault situations or stuff like that. Uh, and, and but still, we want to test if our online bank is able to handle these outages in this third party system. So what we're going to do is we're going to mock it. And we, we're going to create a simulation that uh, behaves as if it is the actual loan processor for our testing purposes. <coughs> um, so I have the application running right here. Uh, it's running on my local machine. So it's that, that makes it much easier to configure some of the stuff that I need for my, uh, for my endpoint. When I log into this, I get the option to request a loan. And for example, I can request a loan for a specific loan amount and with a specific down payment. And if I send that application, it's being processed by the third party loan processor and that loan processor sends back a response that tells me if the loan request was approved or denied. So in this case, it was denied. And at the name of the actual loan provider is uh, Wealth Securities Dynamic Loans or WSDL. Um, and that's just a label. So that's just the name of the loan processor service, really. Uh, and, but this is I, what I've done now is I've sent a loan request to the actual dependency uh, because it was available. But uh, as we said, it's not always available. Maybe it doesn't exactly behave like we want to in our integration testing all of the time. So we are going to replace this actual loan processor service with our own simulation. I've prepared that simulation already uh, using Wiremock. So what I've done is I created a number of, uh, the way Wiremock works is um, you create responses to specific requests and you ask Wiremock to uh, um, listen for incoming requests. And if it has a response that matches specific properties of that request, is going to return that response. Um, so uh, just a little bit about Wiremock. Uh, if you want to know more about Wiremock, this is the website, wiremock.org. Um, it's a Java-based tool, um, but you don't have, uh, you don't actually have to program the simulation in, uh, in Java yourself. Uh, as a, uh, I'm going to show you in the demo in a minute. Uh, I've done it using JSON mapping files, which is also an option. Um, it's probably good to know that this is just an HTTP mock server. So it only supports HTTP and HTTPS. So uh, you can't use wire mock for simulating dependencies that communicate through MQ, for example or JMS or FTP. Um, it only simulates dependencies uh, and that communicate over HTTP. So REST services, SOAP services, for example. Uh, the good part about it, yeah, it's open source. It's developed and maintained by Tomakers. Um, and, and pretty much everything you need to know is on the website, by the way. And so and what Wiremock does is it, it Actually, it spins up an actual HTTP server that is going to listen to incoming requests. And then uh, if it has a suitable definition for a response to that request, it's going to serve up that response. So uh, again, uh, I have prepared some responses here. These, they are, these are um Defined yeah, in JSON mapping files. I could do this in Java code as well, but uh, because this service uh, talks SOAP, the low processor service, and that's a little cumbersome to deal with in Java code, I chose to do this in JSON mapping files instead. So, uh, for example, uh, this is a, a definition of a 
uh, of a, a response definition. So what, uh, what does it say? If the incoming HTTP method is posed to this endpoint, and if the body of the incoming request matches this X path, and basically what it says here is if the incoming loan request is for an amount of $10,000, that's basically what it says. So this only responds to those cases where my incoming request amount is $10,000. I could um, match on entirely different properties of the incoming request, but this is just a decision, a, a design decision that I made for this, uh, for this demo. So you could do, uh, if you say, well, it depends, uh, the, the, I want to respond based on entirely different properties of the incoming request, you can do that with YMOC as well, or with any other proper mocking of or search virtualization tool. Uh, but uh, this response is uh, for the uh, for any incoming request with uh, a loan amount equal to ten thousand. And uh, what it's going it's going to respond with an HTTP status code of two hundred, and the response message that is defined in this XML file, and uh, that's this one. So every time I'm going to send a, uh, receive an incoming request, loan request for $10,000, this is going to be my answer. And as you can see, I set the loan provider name to Tequila Webinar Loan Processor, just to show you that I'm actually talking to the simulation and not to the actual loan processor that we saw in action earlier. So now the only thing I need to do to use the use my simulation instead of uh, the actual uh, load processor is first of all make sure that this uh, that my simulation is running. So my Wiremock simulation is running. I did that right now, and because it's just a jar file, which is uh, included in the project here. Um, it's now running on port 9876 on my uh, on my local machine. Uh, and this, this beautiful piece of ASCII art says, well, my Wiremock instance is running. So it's now actively listening for incoming requests. And the only thing I need to do in Parabank itself is change the endpoint for the Lone Processor service from the actual service. Huh? It's left blank, so it uses the actual Lone Processor service. I say, well, instead of that, send your requests, send the loan requests to, well, the process that's running on this port. And if I now request a same loan, again, for example, with 10,000 and down payment of 100, as you can see, it's now going to be, it's now processed not by the, uh, actual loan processor, but by our simulation now. And so this makes it, uh, and it, this uh, app proves, so to say, that we are now talking to our simulation instead of the, um, the actual loan provider, and the actual uh, loan processor, sorry. Uh, and this means that we can now, uh, Add, task, add cases or add responses for those specific uh, case, uh, those specific uh, test cases that we need to run. So, for example, uh, um, if I want to check that the, uh, as an example, I, I want to test how my uh, online banking application handles. Um, responses that do come in, but take a, take a much longer time, for example. So I want to uh, simulate a delay in the loan processor service. And I want to check that uh, even if the loan processor is very slow to respond, uh, that uh, my online banking application is still able to handle that. Um, I can then just simply add, a, uh, add another definition here that says, uh, th that's this one, for example, and uh, I chose, well, uh, 
if the income and the amount of the incoming loan request uh, is equal to nine thousand, um, just uh, respond, but do that uh, much more slowly. And in this case, I added a fixed delay here. So and uh, Wiremock and basically any other good mocking tool allows you and not to just define your own responses, but also, for example, define the performance behavior of your simulation. So for example, I, I, what I added here is uh, it's it's still going to respond with an OK HTTP status. It's still going to send a proper response. But uh, before it sends the response, it's going to wait for, in this case, 5,000 milliseconds. So, uh, and uh, if that uh, it, it's still going to respond with, well, uh, your low um, request is going to be approved, but well, uh, just to show you that it's yet another simulation says, well, sorry, it took me so long. So if I add, so uh, all I need to, uh, all I need to with the simulation is, is make that uh, is, is come up with this mapping. So, well, um, what and uh, what what input do I need to send to my simulation to make it behave in a specific way? So in this case, uh, I chose the loan amount. So with a loan amount of ten thousand, everything is okay. With a loan amount of nine thousand, everything is okay as well. But uh, it's just going to uh, take the loan process a little longer. So if I click it now, it's going to wait one, two, three, four five seconds, and then it's going to respond. And so uh, it still responds, but it now simulates that case where the loan processor, uh, it's just, uh, it takes the loan processor a little longer to respond. And as you can see, and uh, nothing really went wrong, uh, other than that you get no feedback in, your applica in the application here that your loan request has been submitted. Um, but the, the load processor answers normally, it just takes a little longer. But uh, it, it's approved, but yeah, it took them a little longer, so to say. Um, yet another situation, another a third situation that I might want to simulate is you know, what happens uh, if something went wrong. So for example, um, what happens if the uh, the loan processor returns an HTTP status 503, which means service unavailable, which is an indication that um, the loan processor service is unavailable, so to say. So it, 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 in the death case, it doesn't send an actual response because, well, it didn't process the incoming request, but it just returned an indication that, well, something went wrong over here. Uh, so there is uh, there's a problem here, uh, and you can use that to test if your own application is resilient enough to be able to handle those failures on the load processor side without actually having to configure the actual load processor in such a way that uh, it simulates that error. And so with the simulation, you can just say, well, eh, if this is the income request, just uh, pretend like you are down. And that's what we're doing here. Right? If the incoming re request is for a loan amount of $7,000, it's just going to pretend that the service is unavailable. So for example, if I send in a loan amount for $7,000, this happens. So, um, and this is just the way that the power bank application deals with this kind of error. So it says an internal error has occurred and has been logged. So um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but this is the way, but at least it, uh, it, it, it did this because uh, my low processor service was down, not because the end, or at least my sim because my simulation acted as if the loan processor was down. That's a, that's a better. So uh, it, it's not actually down because if my amount is 10,000, 
it's just going to be approved again. So there's nothing wrong with each simulation or something. It just for an incoming amount of $7,000, it acts as if the loan processor service is down. So we can use that in our testing. <clears throat> so, um, and we did some, and this is uh, how these um, simulations can help you uh, and do some exploratory testing uh, and do more testing in general um, a little bit easier. So and we spun up a Wiremock instance and that's going to listen on port 9876. And we did some, some exploratory testing here or live demoing uh, for a couple of different situations. And uh, we uh, checked that uh, we, uh, we, we checked that our power bank application, so the application that we're developing and testing, is able to handle specific behavior from the load processor. Um, but maybe we also want to do this in our automation. So let's add just so you. So I stopped the Wiremock service now. So if I send another loan request. It's now going to take a while and then fail uh, because there's no loan processor anymore. And so I, I killed this process. It's no longer listening, but it's no longer important for now because now we are um, the other part. And, and this is what I like about Wiremock, for example, is that I can also start it in code. So I have a test here or a number of tests really. Uh, Selenium-based tests on uh, my PowerBank application. So what these do is that before each test, they start Chrome, they maximize the window, and they log in as John with his ultra super secret password of demo. And then I have a couple of tests here. And uh, even though we've seen that the load processor is down, uh, what I'm doing here as part of my tests, I am going to spin up my simulation and because uh, my entire definition, my entire simulation is part of my project, part of my code. So it ships together with my test code and uh, not in this case, but could also be added together with your application code. Um, that simulation is available for everybody is going to work with this code base. So if you check out this repository from Git, uh, you don't just get the, uh, yeah, the, you don't just get the test code, but you also get the simulations that are required to actually perform your test. Because uh, in this case, and I'm using a JUnit rule here, this is this Wiremock rule is going to spin up a, Wiremock server as part of my test run. So and because all of my definitions, all of my simulated, my, my entire simulation is part of my code base here because it's in these JSON mapping files and these uh, can't, uh, there's predefined XML responses. It's just, it's uh, just like my test code, it is part of the same repository. So and when I run this test case, for example, which I'm going to do in a second, um, that rule is going to make sure that my simulation, so the simulated load processor is started just in time, so just before my automated test starts and is uh, taken down again uh, after the test finishes. So it's, it's, it's there, it's live and online only for the duration of the test. But that's enough because that's all that we want to do. We want to run our test. That's, and that automated test, that is going to use that simulation. Uh, so why not make that simulation part of your test code base? So uh, for example, uh, this is the, the happy path, so to say. So a loan for 10,000, which is going to 
uh, with a down base of 500 or of uh, 100. So, and this is going to start my selenium test. Yay, green check marks. So uh, what this test did is uh, it went, it navigated to the request loan uh, window. It filled in the form. So it applied for a loan with uh, a loan amount of 10,000 with a down payment of 100 and it selected this account ID and it checked that uh, the loan application result was approved and the loan provider name was equal to Tequila Webinar Loan Processor. And just as we saw uh, when I did that manually uh, just a couple of minutes ago. And the same, this is probably uh, the best one to demo. And this is the one where I request a loan for 9,000 and uh, it still is going to be approved, but this is the case where the loan processor is just slower. And so and this starts my Chrome browser again, goes to the parent bank, logs in, and here it's one, two, three, four, five seconds again before it responds. And so, and, and, uh, and these are just a couple of examples where uh, these simulations, and they are just part of my test code here now. They are uh, shipped together with my test and maybe even, and, and not in this case, but uh, they can be shipped together with your test and your application code. It's just another artifact in your, so, uh, but all with the goal of not having to rely on these actual external dependencies anymore. Uh, because we now we have our simulations with us uh, and that enable uh, that ena uh, and those simulations they enable us to do all the testing that we want to do and this would be much harder to do with the actual dependency with the actual loan processor I can't tell the actual loan processor to respond but uh, uh, have a delay of 5,000 milliseconds for example I can do that with a simulation. So uh, there are a couple more here. So internal errors, and uh, if I have a uh, so maybe eight thousand is a magic number, which always uh, results in a denied request loan. So the actual uh, amounts do, uh, they don't really matter. But uh, just to show you that I, I can also say, well, this one is denied. And this test passes as well. So uh, this is, um, I am not dependent on the actual implementation of the loan processor anymore or the actual business logic. I can just say, well, um, because that's not important. The actual business logic of this loan processor is not important. What is important for my testing is, is my Parabank application able to process all of the output that is being generated by the loan processor? So I can just say, well, if the amount's equal to 10,000, always approve the loan request. And in this case, if it's 8,000, just deny it because that's just another test case. And so the, and these are some of the things that we can do with uh, a tool like Wiremock. And again, I chose Wiremock here because it's open source. It's easy to use. Uh, it can do a lot of different, it can do a lot of different things. Um, but the actual tool isn't really all that important. Uh, Thomas is probably going to hate me for saying this, but it's not all that important. Uh, what's much more important is Ed, Ed, that hopefully this gave you an idea about how you can use these simulations uh, with a tool like Wiremock, but it could be any other tool uh, to help you uh, be less dependent on the actual dependencies that you have to deal with in your test environment. That's the much more uh, important part of uh, what I'm trying to, uh, what I wanted to tell you here. Um, all of the, uh, the, the code that you saw, uh, so the Selenium code and the Wiremock uh, simulations, uh, they're all on GitHub if you want to review them, if you want to uh, test those out for yourself, <coughs> um, they are available on 
or GitHub or my GitHub page. I also, and for those of you who say, oh, that looks like an interesting tool. I want to learn, I want to learn a little bit more about Wiremock itself, Wiremock as a tool. Um, I have a free open source workshop on that, and which you can find uh, at, uh, at this link. Uh, that contains a slide deck with uh, a lot of slides explaining uh, what it is that Wiremock does, but also um, hands-on exercises and the answers to those exercises. So you can practice yourself with uh, some of the things that Wiremock can do, because Wiremock can do a lot more than the things I've just shown you. Uh, if you want to dive a little deeper into what do, what that tool can do, um, this is probably a good starting point. Um, and before we move to the uh, to the Q and A part, um, a couple of things that you need to be aware of, really, uh, when you're talking about simulations, um, because simulations uh, they they are still simulations. Um, this is what's called, uh, what's known as a Rube Goldberg machine, which is uh, basically the definition of a Rube Goldberg machine is a machine that is incredibly complex, uh, but meant to do a very simple thing. Uh, in the end, uh, all of this, what's happening over here is meant to turn on a light switch. I've seen and I've done this with this kind of simulation in the past as well. I've built incredibly intricate, complex simulations that behaved exactly like the actual application in with every single edge case or fault case that you could imagine. Um, That's probably, uh, you probably, uh, if you if you try to do it, you're probably going to run into difficulties very quickly. Um, the, the trick, the fine line that you need to walk here is simulate just enough so you can uh, have to facilitate your testing instead of just, re uh, because it is very tempting to just rebuild the entire application that you're simulating in a simulation. Um, the trick is, uh, and, and uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the way to do this successfully is just to just simulate just enough uh, to be able to do the testing that you want to do. And, um, and keep it as simple as possible and just as straightforward as possible. Just think about what are the conditions that I want to test? How do I want my uh, simulation to behave? and model just those cases and nothing more, uh, because that's enough for you to do your testing. Instead of just, and don't be tempted to rebuild the entire application as a simulation, because, well, then you could have just rebuilt the application yourself and be done with it. And, and finally, um, a simulation is just that. It is a simulation. It is not the real thing. Uh, and while I've hopefully shown you and, 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 and I've tried to make it a little more clear that, that simulations can help you to, yeah, to test earlier, to test more and to test more often, it is not like, it's not the same as testing or against the real thing. So uh, using these simulations, it is not meant to fully replace um, integration and end-to-end -end testing with those actual real life components. And it is meant to help you speed up your testing process to find some of the defects uh, in your own application earlier and to simulate those, uh, those hard to recreate conditions. But it is not meant to entirely uh, replace testing against the actual thing because there is no substitute for testing with the real thing. Um, that's it for me. That's what I wanted to tell you. That's what I wanted to show you. I am really curious to hear if there are any questions. Yeah, we have a few questions. Uh, sure. Okay, so 
actually we have quite good number of questions uh, so one question is what are the some approaches for mocking dynamic api uh, which return dynamic data objects that's like updated list of events which updates every 15 seconds good question um and the first question I would like to ask is, do you really need an updated version of events? Do you need to, uh, what, what, what is the data that you really need? Is it, uh, do you really need a list of events that's updated every 15 seconds? Um, and that's the first question I would ask in return. Um, if you don't need that, then it's probably uh, enough to just return the same set of events every single time if you uh if you do need an update every x number of seconds um you can do that too with these kinds of tools and you can do that with wire mock uh for example through java code for uh, by programming that in java code for example uh other uh, service fertilization tools they they have options to do this as well so um, it's definitely possible to simulate that. Uh, but my first question was, is that really necessary? Because that, that, that's, that might be a very good example of what I just showed you a couple of slides ago about making things more complicated than you really need for your test. But yeah, it can be done. Okay, thanks, Bess. Uh, I will pick up some other questions. So how do you efficiently generate mocks so they're easier to maintain when the schema is updated, updated or changes? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Updating, uh, updated schemas. Um, some tools, uh, and especially at the, the commercially licensed tools, they are able to update or regenerate simulations uh, based on schemas. So if a, uh, a schema or specific, uh, for example, uh, an open API specification or WSDL in, in, in cases of SOAP, when they change, uh, those tools are often able to update your simulations as well. Um, why are mock specifically? I don't know. I'd have to look that up. How easy or how hard that is to uh, because uh, the the simulations that I, I've shown you they are not linked to any scheme at all and if there's no link to a schema or a specification it's not it's never going to auto update or to uh, to uh, to do that but I know because I've worked with a couple of uh, commercial tools that do something like that that they can do it and I'm not sure about uh, Wiremock or the other open source tools, to what extent they do support this. I'd have to look that up really. Okay. So maybe we are running a slightly right. So going for the final question. Um, so what will be the best approach to run the same set of automated tests that we run for Wiremock for the real environment? For example, if we are asked to do the integration test with the real environment, um, so, um, and what I've, uh, there are two things that need to change here then, uh, probably at least one, uh, in this, in this specific case is, um, first of all, and you need to, uh, I don't, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm just, things are popping into my head while I'm talking and uh, that's distracting me. Um, First of all, you need to make sure that uh, either you have uh, different data sets for, uh, or no, either and make sure that your simulation takes these, accepts the same test data, right? because there's test data in here. So there's an amount here, but and most importantly, there's an account number in here, for example. Uh, my simulation, it just ignores this, really. Uh, the only thing uh, why it's important is because it is in the uh, in the dropdown here. So there's one, two, three, four, five. This is the the, the value that's being selected. 
So you need to make sure that the data that you're using in your test is available both in the simulation as well as in the actual dependency. Um, that's not as easy as it sounds often and because that's one of the actual problems that we try to overcome with our tests. And, but maybe you have a different data set that you load for the simulations and another one that you use with the uh, with the real dependency that's just a little more limited. Uh, and in this case, and the only thing I need to check, I can probably, uh, if I want to run this test against the real dependency, all I need to do here is um, update the configuration of my application on the test to not use the simulation anymore, but the actual loan processor. And if I'm going to run this test now, this test is going to fail, by the way, because the loan processor name is different. But all I need to do is I tell my application to not communicate with the simulation anymore, but with the actual, uh, with the actual dependency. And because here there are no problems with my test data because I can still fill in these values and still pick this account ID because that just exists in my application. And but you see it fails here because the, in this case, the loan processor name is not Tequila Webinar Loan Processor anymore, but the name of the actual loan processor. So you need a way to update that configuration on the fly, so to say, in your application on the test, and to be able to configure what is the endpoint that it's communicating with. Uh, so in this case, we have an admin screen for that. I could even automate this at the setting of this. I could do that. Uh, I had to switch from testing against the live loan processor to testing against the simulation. Uh, uh, but that, that's also an important thing you need to change. Eh? What, uh, what are the endpoints that my application on the test is, uh, is talking to, really? Cool. I think uh, we can just wind up. Thank you so much, Bas. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience with us. That was really, truly an incredible session. I have learned a lot personally. I can see that I could easily implement uh, some of the points in, in the next sprint itself if I would like to. So there are a lot of learning oh. that I have, I have learned this session. I think, I hope it will be the same for our audience also. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you for finding time to share, uh, finding time to share your experience with us. You are uh, welcome. So um, and just before you uh, you move on to the, because uh, you're going to present now and take over. Um, if there are uh, any questions, any additional questions, or uh, you want to have a copy of the slides or anything, uh, just send me an email or uh, send me a message on LinkedIn. Uh, so there are, uh, there are uh, a couple of ways to contact me, really. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to to um, continue the conversation there. Uh, and now it's over to you, uh, Tim. Cool. So we can move to the next session. So we have a quiz for everyone. And if you're familiarized with the Kahoot quiz, this is a Kahoot quiz. So the questions will be uh, asked on the screen. Let me share my screen for one second. One second. I guess, yes. Can you see the screen, bus? I can, yes. Okay, cool. So this is a Kahoot quiz and um, you can go to kahoot.it on your phone or desktop and uh, you can input this number 1434584. So just go to this URL kahoot.it and input this number 1434584. Yeah, you can input your name. So your name will be coming out here. So if you have not played this game, so there will be 10 questions. 
and the question will be displayed on the screen when I start and um, you can answer the answer the question on the option displayed on your phone. Okay, so uh, the points will be calculated based on how much faster you have uh, attended the answer. If it is correct, then it will calculate the time, then the points will be allocated. So the top three winners will be getting Google Chromecast sponsored by Updoors. We will wait for another one minute to let join everyone. If anyone having any difficulty, please uh, type in the chat. I can help you out. Okay. Another 30 seconds. Okay, if you have confused, then just go to kahoot.it and input this number 1434584 and then input your name okay just start so the question will be displayed on the screen and you can answer using your phone. So the first question comes now. Yeah, Wiremark built on. So you can select all of these four questions. So you can check your phone and click on the corresponding answer. Yeah, three seconds to go. Yeah, it's Java. Let's go to the next session and see who is in the top. So Jinji has got 928 points, GM 925, Vaishali 916. Let's go to the second question. HTTP status code 3XS series stands for. So you can select the corresponding answer. Yeah, it's redirection. Okay, GM comes to the first place. Okay, next HTTP status code 504 stands for. Nine seconds to go. Yeah, it's gateway timeout. Wow, Alok came out of nowhere. Next question. Subservice uses web caching mechanism. Is it true or false? Okay, only two options are easy to answer. You got 50% chance to. Okay, it's false. Let's look at the standing position. Oh, Yashika came to the first place. Next question. Which protocol is used to communicate between Selenium bindings and browsers? Yeah, please select your answer. Yeah, we are halfway through the quiz. Five questions to go now. Yeah, 
it's http yashika on first place nidin came to the second place next question warmok was originally created by yeah it's tom okay no changes in the first three positions next question which param is used to sort filter resource okay it's query okay why shall it to the third place which possible markup language can be used in restful web api wait easy question xml and json okay bus is came bus is really trying hard okay it's a true or false question stepping refer to how can pre predefined response is it true or false it's true okay no change in the positions last question mock is referred to defining a behavior during test initialization is it true or false it's true So let's see who won the third place. Yashika, congratulations! Bas, second place, awesome. And first place goes to GM. So I don't know who GM is. So please uh, take a screenshot of your winning page and uh, send it to us to takilasgmail.com. So just claim your uh, prize. So we will be contacting you to get your uh address and we will be shipping the chromecast to your home so bas we will be shipping you our shipping the price to netherland no worries thank you so much and uh, uh it's been a great pleasure thank you thank you for participating have a great weekend okay bye bye see you thank you all for joining thank you all for your time